knowing full well that his family is left to, to complete starvation with no source of support. What he's done, of course, is to force his only daughter, Sonia, into prostitution. His own daughter, he's forced into prostitution. She has to please other men and make physical contact in order to bring home money for the family. And as a matter of fact, some of that, even some of that money, he uh, stole. He pours forth his despair to Raskolnikov and says, tell me, sir, can you say that such a person is anything but a scoundrel? What can a person do when they literally have no place to go in this world? And of course, the question is very germane to Raskolnikov in the situation he is. He has no answer. But in any case, Raskolnikov helps him to go home and back to the apartment where Raskolnikov meets the family. And of course, sees a terribly consumptive woman in Katerina Ivanovna who has tremendous gusts of passion but still cares about the family. And of course, her two children and of course the, the reputation of Sonia, who by this time has been forced into prostitution and has to live in a different place. In those days, the prostitutes had to live in a certain section of the city. And so we see this scene of terrible need, and Raskolnikov thinks, my God, what a human being can be brought to. And suddenly, as he leaves on impulse, this very Raskolnikov who's planning a hideous crime, capable of, uh, of considering himself a Napoleon and a Muhammad, takes the last money that he has in his pocket and leaves it for the children, for the family. This very same Raskolnikov, in other words, remember the idea of the double. There are two very distinct sides of Raskolnikov. On the one hand, a kind of uh, philanthropy and understanding and, and, and human feeling that's incredible. And on the other hand, a capability of the most bloody kind of behavior. A human being is a fairly complicated individual. And furthermore, you will notice that in the novel, there are two characters who correspond to these sides of um, Raskolnikov. On the one hand, there is Sonia. The daughter has been forced into prostitution, but who uh, adheres to the Christian religion, who is deeply Christian herself, who wants to sacrifice her entire life for the good of her family, for the good of her younger brother and sister, for the good of her stepmother. Uh, a humane person of the deepest sort. And then <laughs> there is another kind of character who is very close to the other side of Raskolnikov. When he comes back to his room, there's a knock on the door, and the servant comes in. The servant has been making terrible fun of him. What are you doing here, lying in bed all day and all night, dreaming when you should, you should be going out and supporting yourself? My God, man, you'll have nothing to eat. You'll be starving. This time she knocks on the door, and she produces a letter. And the letter turns out to be from Raskolnikov's mother, Pulcheria. Again, it's interesting, the name, Pulchera in Latin, of course, means beautiful. There's something very beautiful about the Raskolnikov family about Raskolnikov, his sister, and his mother. And, of course, that appears in the name uh, of his mother. And the mother writes a long letter. Well, of course, we've all, had, we've all been in school and have letters from our parents, and we know what that feels like. It's not entirely unusual for a parent to make, want to make you feel just a little bit guilty about all the money that they're spending on your education, all the sacrifices they've made on your behalf. She says, oh, of course, Ros uh, Rod Rodion Romanovich is his name. Rodion Romanovich, she, she, she says, well, she calls him, Rodia, she calls him. Uh, Rodia, look, you know what we think about your career. You know what great hopes we place, and we're so proud of what you're doing in Petersburg. You go right ahead, son, and do what you're doing, and I want you to know how your sister feels about it. The sister, the nickname is Dunya. Dunya is so concerned that you be supported while you're doing your studies that she went into the service of a particular uh, sort of semi-nobleman by the name of Svidri Gailov. Svidri Gailov. At one point, uh, she was hired as a governess in the house of Svidri Gailov, and when she went into the house, he turned out to be, uh, uh, well, what, what shall I say, not a very nice man. Uh, he tried to seduce her. Uh, he tried to make of her not a governess, but something much worse. And Dunya, with disgust and with pride, refused his advances. But somehow, the wife got uh, wind of it and somehow turned it all around, thinking that Dunya was the seducer, and put, made, in the first place, forced Dunya out of the house in the middle of the night with all of her dirty laundry and all of her dirty sheets with her in an open cart to go through the village, uh, made a total disgrace for Dunya. And uh, Dunya had to go back home in disgrace in the city. Well, it, it turned out uh, Svidigailov was decent enough at least to let her know the true situation. Then she went around the city gossiping each house to restore the reputation of Dunya, and a certain Mr. Luzhin, 
uh, in Russian, the, the name means mud puddle. Luzha is a mud puddle. A certain Mr. Luzhin is tremendously attracted to Dunya because, aha, here is a beautiful, moral, wonderful young woman who will be completely dependent on me. Uh, Luzhin proposed marriage to her. After all, he was a lawyer in Petersburg. He was home on, on a visitation. She wanted him to intercede for Raskolnikov, her brother, uh, when he wanted to get into the uh, practice of law. So Dunya agrees to marry him. And in this letter, uh, the mother says to Raskolnikov, Value the sacrifice of your sister. Value what she has done for you, Rodya. Always be faithful to her. And Oskornikov is furious. The idea that his sister would dare to think that she could sacrifice for him, he who is so proud, who is so ready to sacrifice for the whole world, he's furious at his sister, he's furious at his mother, but most of all, he's furious at Svidrigailov. What sort of a man is this old lecher? And of course, whenever he sees anybody whom he likes, whom he dislikes, the first thing is, you, 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 Svidrigailov, you. In his imagination, Svidrigailov is the worst kind of villain. And clearly, Svidrigailov is going to be this other side of Raskolnikov, quite different from the side ready to sacrifice his last coin for the benefit of young children. Well, he can no longer contain himself. He goes out, and of course, there's some wonderful scenes. Uh, he goes to see an old pawnbroker woman uh, who deals in, um, uh, in secondhand items that she, uh, buy, that she buys very cheaply. That she gives the money to the people giving to her and then sells them, of course, at a very high price and comes out very well in the bargain. Uh, he goes to visit her to sort of stake out her house because a terrible plot is coming up in his mind. She is going to be the victim of this murder that he will carry out for the good, not only of his career, but for the good of humanity. Because after all, what is this pawnbroker woman who lives in an old place with a thin neck covered with grease and a, a rag around it, uh, with an apartment in which the sun comes in at an angle through the window and the, turns the mahogany furniture in the apartment red? Of course, you can just see the blood in that red. Uh, it's quite a scene. He stakes, what, as we would put it, he stakes out the house. He sees the place where she keeps her money, and he plots very carefully what the murder will be. And then he goes out. He's under such tension at this point, under such pressure, that he can't stand it anymore. He goes out into uh, a place where there are trees and bushes. Now, in the previous novel, the, the, the novel before the last one that I talked about in Poor Folk, the one place where you have a sort of a release from Petersburg is a diary of Varvara. You remember Va Varvara Dobrosyolova, where she talks about the countryside as a wonderfully warm place uh, that she remembers in extraordinary contrast to the heaviness and hardness of the concrete city. Uh, the countryside is green, the city is dusty and concrete. It's quite different here. Raskolnikov goes out to one of the parks on the island in St. Petersburg where it was green and grasses and bush. Uh, he has just gone to a tavern where he's down some vodka, and of course in his condition the vodka goes right to his head. He can no longer stay on his feet. He falls underneath a bush to sort of protect himself and falls asleep. And in the sleep he has a dream, <laughs> the likes of which, God help, that you and I never have. We all know what nightmares are. Uh, but, of course, this dream has become a kind of the, the, super, uh, the super edition of every person's nightmare. He dreams that he's back uh, with his father as a young boy, and there was a brother who had died before him, and they were going to the cemetery where the brother had been buried because they were carrying a sweet dish with a cross of raisins on top. This was, uh, you know, to give uh, uh, remembrance to the dead. And as they uh, walked along, they passed a tavern where a drunken peasant was inviting a crowd uh, into a cart hitched to a broken-down old horse who couldn't possibly pull such a, lord, uh, a load. Uh, they said, Mikolka, are you crazy? You're going to try to get that horse to pull the cart? He said, look, it's my horse. It's my property. I'm going to get him to pull the cart. He said, come on, man, you're crazy. He said, get in. And of course, such was the force that they all got in. He raised the whip and he said to the horse, all right. Giddy up, or the Russian equivalent of giddy up. And the horse strained with all of its force and, of course, could barely rise off the ground, much less pull the uh, cart. He began to whip the horse, whip the sides of the horse, and nothing happened. They all began to yell, and, of course, they were in a drunken, uh, drunken fury. That didn't work. He began to beat the horse across the eyes 
with a whip. You, you can feel that whip across your eyes when he does it. It's sadism pushed to the nth degree, something, alas, that Dostoevsky was very, maybe I shouldn't say alas, that Dostoevsky was very skilled in doing, but it, it, just the thought of it makes you shiver. And it goes on and on. Of course, the, the horse tries, tries, tries. Finally, he takes an iron bar and smashes the horse across the head. And of course, the horse collapses in a pile of blood. The young boy can't stand it anymore. He breaks loose from his father. He runs up. He tries to embrace the horse. The peasant comes toward him. And of course, he wakes up. You know what happens in a nightmare at that point. <sighs> he says, is it possible that I am going to try to do to that pawnbroker what I just did in that dream? You understand, of course, the dream, of course, was all of his own imagination. There was no real horse, no real peasant. It all came out of his own head. Is it possible? No, no, he said. This is something I can't do. And for a moment, you think that he has worked it through in the form of a bad dream. You know that Freud is very fond of this explanation, that somehow we were in these nightmares who work through terrible feelings that otherwise might cause terrible things in the real world. And he slowly walks back across the river, seeing, you understand, this is summertime in St. Petersburg, and the sun is low on the horizon. It's very far north, and it casts a crimson light, a crimson and rose light across the landscape. I've seen this many times. If you're ever in Petersburg, be sure to be there at that time. It's an incredible sight. No, I've gone through it. And as he's crossing the bridge, or after he crosses the bridge, he sees the half-sister who lives with the old pawnbroker woman, and overhears her saying that she's going to be away at a certain time in the evening, and he realizes the coast will be clear. So by sheer chance, the murder is once again on. And then, of course, <laughs> Dostoevsky describes it in such a way that André Gide, the famous cr French critic, once read this book and said, C'est Dostoevsky. A-t-il tué quelqu'un? This Dostoevsky, has he ever killed anybody? <laughs> he couldn't, Gide couldn't believe that a person could describe a murder the way he did and not somehow have been involved in murder himself. First of all, of course, he has to get the axe, the axe which he's going to hide under his uh, uh, shabby coat. And uh, he suddenly realizes that the axe is in the caretaker's place and people are all around. They'll see him take the axe. He can't do it when somebody's watching. But at that particular moment, he sneaks down the steps because, of course, the landlady is after him for the rent, which he hasn't paid for a while. And furthermore, he agreed to marry her daughter and uh, has, has sort of reneged on that. She's quite angry at him. He manages to escape the landlady. And for the moment, the caretaker has gone out. He grabs the axe and nobody has seen him. And then step by step, we follow him through the streets. By the way, in Petersburg today, there's a tour called In the Steps of Dostoevsky, where you can go through exactly these same steps and see exactly the same buildings in the novel. And so he gets to the apartment. He rings the bell, very reminiscent of the bell, of course, in, in Macbeth of Shakespeare. Remember, he had, hear it, not Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. You remember that when you get that, that round thing that he pulls and you hear the bell. He, she opens it up. She's very suspicious, seeing the look on his face, but she lets him in. And he, he claims to have a pledge, which he's given to her. It's very tightly tied up. It's actually a piece of wood. It's very tightly tied up. And while she's unraveling the uh, string, he takes the axe and with a blunt end, hits her full force over the head. She falls and blood springs forth like a fountain. It's hideous. It's truly hideous. And of course, as if that's not bad enough, as he's rummaging through the trunk trying to get money, her sister walks in. And of course, is horrified at what she sees. He takes the axe and with a sharp side, splits her skull in two. It's as horrible as it can possibly be. And then, of course, he tries to grab all the money and get out. But as he tries to get out, there are people coming to see the old man. He has to come back into the apartment and lock the door while they're on the outside. And suddenly they realize that somebody has to be inside because the door couldn't be locked the way it is if there weren't somebody there. And then, of course, the question is, is he going to be able to get out without their seeing him? And Dostoevsky arranges it in a very clever way so that while they go out to try to get some help and the other man goes away for a second, he goes down, sneaks into a room, they go past him, and goes out scot-free. Nobody has seen him. So presumably, he has committed what we might call the perfect crime. But, <laughs> perfect crime, what happens to the consciousness of a man who's done that? Well, that we'll see when we talk about the novel.